Welcome back to the Audio Act Show. My first guest tonight uh, was a, a member of a great, great sketch group that was on MTV and briefly on CBS mm -hmm. uh, back in the day in the early 90s, and now has gone on to do a bunch of stuff on his own. Here is uh, the great Kevin Allison. What's up, buddy? Hey, it's great to be here. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So the state was, I mean, you guys were all NYU guys. Yeah. Now, this yeah. was, when I started in comedy was the early 90s, and uh, I had the same agent for a while, James Dixon. Oh, yeah. You actually did a sketch based on James Dixon, right? Isn't that the one <laughs> sketch that Tom did was based on Dixon? Yeah, right? totally, to be, right? totally. And, uh, you know, it was a fun time for comedy back then, and uh, William Morris in New York, and uh, no one knew what was going on with Saturday Night Live, where they're going to come back, and all this stuff, and the, it's when Saturday Night Live was really going through a bad time with critics, and so sketch comedy was fun in New York, because a lot of people were trying their own thing, and you guys were really the cream of the crop. It was great. Oh, thank you, and yeah. You, you had a great uh, run on MTV, and then briefly on CBS, yeah. and then it went away, <laughs> yeah. but uh, the stuff was real original. Oh, thank really you, yeah. Really great, yeah. Yeah, we were we were just like a bunch of friends from from yeah, college. Yeah, from college, yeah. we were just writing comedy and performing. We right? would just get stoned, come up with silly titles, and <laughs> write sketches. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How many people were in that? It was quite a few people. Eleven. Eleven people. Eleven. Right? Yeah, a right. ridiculous amount of people to try to get to cooperate. Right. Yeah. Well, cooperate is one thing, and if you want to try to make any money, <laughs> you're splitting it a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, we, when when we would they would put us on hiatus, right. we would end up going to unemployment, and the checks were the same size. <laughs> <laughs> That's, right. That's horrible, but I mean, uh, still, I was it was you know you're young and it's just fun. Though. You're oh, on yeah. television doing Pretty sketches, sure. and you were kind of uh, you know sort of progressive for your time. You're a gay guy doing gay material. Yeah, in yeah, a lot yeah. Of ways. We, uh, we we had a uh, Marino Wayne and Ken I, Marino. Yeah, yeah, right. We we sat in a room one night and we were like we've never ever written a sketch together what could we write together so I said, uh, the Jew, the Italian, and the redhead gay. <laughs> so we went ahead. And you were who in that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> After that, it was like, well, the cat's out of the bag. So what was the premise of that sketch then? You were you were just like guys, three guys that were all those things. Yeah, it was just a just sketch talking? where, where, where it, it was making fun of the fact that on sitcoms, people just are yeah. a stereotype exactly. and nothing else. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. a beer commercial. Yeah, like a big exactly. beer commercial. It's just through beer commercial. In, in, in course, Light like commercials, uh, an Asian guy, a black guy, and a very, very non threatening white guy right. all hang out together. Like the most non threatening white guy you could imagine. Uh, well, let's, you know, so now after that ends, CBS was a quick run, right? That yeah, was well, like, we were too big for our britches. We quit MTV. We were to like, go to we, CBS. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then CBS, they fired us right after one show. I remember not understanding any of that, man. I remember, talk about not giving the people a chance to, you know, John, of course, this wasn't his world, either uh, playing football and stuff, but they, they were as really as hot as a sketch comedy group could get. Yeah. And again, in the, in the, in the mid, the, the early 90s, there were the, the cast of SNL was a cast I thought was hilarious, but the critics hated it. Mm. It was the Adam Sandler, Chris Farley days. Yeah. Mm. And the talk was that that was going to go away, Saturday Night Live. Mm. So there was a bunch of sketch groups that were really trying to be the next SNL. To go up against And them. you guys were really, like, uh, at the forefront of it and had a great run on MTV. And it's like typical network stuff. CBS signed you. And I can remember going... Well, they're probably going to give them a chance to just really thrive, and and they fired you in a week, right? I yeah. Mean, doesn't yeah. make any any sense at all. No. Well, it was in the, hindsight. What happened? Like, there was the, a new guy coming in. I knew, to, so he to, had to put to, his own sta stamp. Yeah, on. and he was like, "Who are these kids? I don't want." Was it Moonves coming in? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Was it was Moonves coming in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, and then we managed to get the executive in charge of us fired. <laughs> 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 Why? Because he just you just didn't uh, pay attention to offensive notes or something? Yeah. Well, no, we. <laughs> Quoted some things that he said about racial uh, oh, stuff really? that we should try to like get into the show and oh, like, you're yeah, yeah, too. We I don't I don't remember which of us said it, but it got into what they wanted more magazine. urban. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, that's hilarious. Yeah, so so we were fired. He was fired. Everyone was unhappy. Mm. Oh my God, that's that's I don't know. I know that was the case. Well, that makes it even funnier. Uh, so now, what what happens after that for you? Uh, after that was many years of starvation and, uh, and drinking. Can be brutal. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. Because I was in live on tape. 
That, oh, yeah. was, that was the which was the group that sort of followed you guys. I helped create that group, and then I went to Mad TV. Yeah, uh, which you know got on Fox and was successful in the sense that it stayed on for fourteen years. Yeah, but it was the the first time another show sort of ate into the ratings of SNL. Yeah. And then what happened was they got rid of the Farley years and everything. Will Farrell came on and SNL yeah. was reborn. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, but it's funny you say that because Mad TV, that was our thing. That's how we stayed on was urban. Oh, yeah. And Mad yeah. TV was all about urban sketches. Like, let's parody rap songs. And, like, you know, we had, you know, three black people in the cast and they were like, that's what we're about. That's what we're going to attack. And um, that's how that's how we stayed on the air, I think. Wow. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went the non-racist route where you guys were racist. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. It helps. So, so you guys, so you just like, did you ever do stand up or anything? Or? Well, that's the thing. Like the group was very like had little clicks, and I was always the black sheep. I was always the loner wandering around. So, right. So when the group broke up, everyone broke up into these little clicks, and I was like, oh, I guess I'll do sketch comedy by myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's hard to do. Yeah. That's very difficult. <laughs> I was just getting up on stage doing crazy characters. Alone. Right. And it just wasn't going anywhere for years. So finally, in 2008, I did a solo show called F Up. It right. was about uh, five guys who have effed up their careers. <laughs> <laughs> All very clearly based on me. But that's amazing. Think about it. So that's, we're talking 14 years later now. Uh, 2008 from 94. Yeah. And, you're now, and you put this up. And well, the, yeah, the state. Yeah, I guess we were officially broken up in 96. We were okay. trying to write movies for a while. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I, I did this show out in San Francisco at their sketch fest, and Michael Ian Black came to see it. Right. And I said, what would you think of the show? And he said, I think that people just want you to drop the act and start talking like yourself. Uh, and I said, that's the thing. I'm too gay, I'm too kinky, and I'm too Midwestern and polite, and I'm too That's absurd. an odd combination. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all this stuff that doesn't make sense together. You're too so, kinky and too Midwestern polite. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, it, it seems too risky. And he said, that's it. If go. it seems risky, go uh, with it. Yeah, That's cool. So the very next week, I was like, all right, I'll tell a true story on stage at show. So I told about the first time I tried prostitution. <laughs> on which end were you? On, on, the, on the giving end. On wow. The, on the give me some dough right before Wow. Uh, right before uh, uh, we were hired. Okay. MTV. It was literally like the weekend before we found out, oh, we're hired. You gotta, I'm a TV you gotta pay star some bill. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. But I was terrified to tell this story and then I found out, like, I look out at the audience and indeed, while I'm telling the story, I'm like, oh, this is too gay, this is too kinky, and I'm a little bit too polite and Midwestern sounding right now. <laughs> and I realized that the audience just kind of loved it. So right. I was like, the hey, honesty. yeah. Sure. I, I, I decided to create a show called Risk where people tell true stories that they never thought they'd dare to share in Ever. public. Ever, yeah. yeah. So the show started, it's a podcast and a live show. We do live shows once a month in New York and L.A. Now, is there a clean version you could tell us real quick of the prostitution story? Oh, well, you know, it was funny. I, I got Like, how did that happen? Like, I, what did you do? I was living with a guy who, at that time, was like, I didn't realize that he revealed it to me. He was like, uh, I was having a hard time paying the rent, and he was the other oh, was guy Was it a in romantic relationship, or just No, roommates? no, not at all, roommates. just roommates. Right. And he was like, hey, you know what? Prostitution can actually be fun. <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> is, this, is this your helpful? Yeah, you know, it's like, like a light bulb. Bunk bunk bunk. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> My life just figured out life. <laughs> he had all these tips, and he had them in these little, like, like catchy phrases. Like, um, <laughs> what was it? It was uh, money before honey. <laughs> Uh, well, that's everyone knows that one. Yeah, sweetie, phone home instead of et phone home, meaning that you should call someone before you go anywhere. Right? right okay. I forgot all of these little catchphrases as soon as I was in the situation. <laughs> I was I was way too polite and midwestern for any of it. Um, but yeah, no, no, I ended up getting in a cab with someone, going downtown, right. and, and I was so confused about what the negotiation was between us. I was like, wait, wait, what are the terms? I was not good at figuring out well, like, who how would they, be? How Think about that, I mean, especially the first time. <laughs> Who's good at that the first time? <laughs> it's 
was so awkward to begin with. And you know what happened? Like, he he was so irate and wanting to get things going right there in the camp. And we ended up in, like, a shopping match. Like, it was, like, total, like, Laurel and Hardy. Well, maybe that's what he wanted. He wanted to pay for some. Maybe that's what he was into. <laughs> right? He was into Could you a, beat the hell out of me? Aggressiveness, <laughs> like, uh, like Mike over there. <laughs> was it Mike? <laughs> well, you guys, well, that's the thing. You got to think about a guy in that situation. If it's a guy who's in the closet in his life, you're talking about the most paranoid situation ever for the guy, probably. Yeah, well, he was So he's going to be a little nervous, right? Yeah, he was like a yuppie in a really Uh, nice suit. Most of the guys, it it was this bar. This was pre-Giuliani, so it was in this bar where that's what everyone was doing. You could buy an M80, smoke a joint, (laughs) and have a gay prostitution moment. (laughs) And then at noon, (laughs) pre-Giuliani. But most of the men there looked like Rush Limbaugh, you know what I mean? Like (laughs) They were all like clearly owned banks and stuff. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, but yeah, yeah, Risk really took off, and uh, eventually fans started like daring me. It's a great stuff. premise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I told I, a guy came to do the show once. His name was Jefferson, and he told a story about how he once attended an erotic biting workshop. Oh my god! And I said, Jefferson, where <laughs> the does, hell is that? Where do you attend a workshop like that? And he said, Oh, I'm going to this kink camp. In, yeah. a, in a month, you should come. <laughs> and I said, oh, I know I've told crazy stories on the show about, like, sex, like the prostitution sort of thing, but I don't know anything about, like, dominance and submission and right. sadomasochism. Sounds like fun. He said, Kevin, take a risk. Right. So it was like the show was, like, daring. Perfect. So I went to this kink camp. This was, the, now, this was when I was 41, so two years ago. Yeah. And it was a transformative <laughs> Really? It, it is weird at that age to, like, something going, wow, it changed my life, it, right? It totally did, because I had been married for nine years to, to a guy, and, you know, we had an open relationship, but we were very vanilla. You know, we were right. very, like... Wait, like, so you cl- never lived in, in, in the closet, which is, which is great. You always were in the open and never went through that hell of having to live a lie. Well, in Cincinnati, when I grew up. Oh, because, well, no, I'm young. Okay, that's I, hard. I, I'm I sorry, knew you know. from when I was a little... But as a, I'm saying, when did you officially know that? Well, that's the thing. The very first thing I remember thinking, I, I was like, I think three and a half or maybe... That young? Wow. Yeah, yeah, I remember I was... Uh, I saw this little statue of a Hummel figurine where it's a kid crawling around and his diapers have fallen <laughs> off or something like that. And I remember thinking, I, I really like boy dogs. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, you were in Cincinnati, you're going, I like Pete Rose for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I like when Pete Rose slides head first. <laughs> all the wrong. Well, no, I, I, but dude, man, I'm so happy that you were able to get out. And not live that adult hell. Because it's got to be, to live a secret life like that in the Midwest. Blah, blah. And look at that, people from here, like I'm from Jersey, 10 miles outside of Manhattan, the most, you know, progressive cosmopolitan place on the planet. And, you know, my neighborhood was no better growing up as far as homophobia. Yeah, that's true. With, uh, than um, the Midwest. It just, it was all, it's all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the kid's got to really be brave. And the, so you go from there to NYU, the middle of the village. Yeah. And you're like, was that at all intimidating? Or was it always just like, this is the greatest thing ever? Oh, with the, the, there's a story, one of the second stories. You know, okay, let's, still, let's take a break. Oh, But, sure, but I want to sure. hear it. I really, because to me, coming from that, knowing at that age, that young, you're gay. Now you go from Cincinnati to the corner of Christopher and 7th Avenue South, it's either going to be intimidating or I would think, hopefully, this is the greatest time ever. You know? <laughs> it was the greatest time And also ever. being a creative, funny guy, we yeah. can be funny. And you just, okay, wait, wait, I want to hear this. I want to hear more of this. <laughs> See, I, I'm into the show. Uh, okay, come back and we'll hear more of this on the Arnie Lang Show. Welcome back to the Arnie Lang Show. Talking to Kevin Allison, host of the podcast Risk, uh, a cast member of uh, the late 90s sketch group from MTV and CBS uh, State, and he grew up in Cincinnati, found that he was gay at the age of three and a half, <laughs> moved from Cincinnati to go to NYU, and he's in the middle of the West Village, and here we go. <laughs> so what happened? I was 18, and I was so horny by that time. I'm Cause, sure. Cause we all are. <laughs> Cincinnati was like, it's like, it's not like homosexuality, it doesn't exist, it's like sexuality. Well, did you lose your virginity exist. by that time? We were virgin when you came to New York? Uh, no, I had done little bits and pieces of things with friends getting, Girls or getting guys? them g- guys getting so you've, them drunk. You've never been with a girl. Uh, well, <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> I, you know, this, way, this is amazing. Let's start off with your first trip here, then we'll get to the girl. Yesterday. 
<laughs> this is an exclusive event. All right, so you come huh. here and you had it. You were so you get it. You're not sexual at all, really, but we're, you're horny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I very little, had not very little right. experience that right. was acknowledged. And you come here to be a freshman at NYU. Yeah, and I'm I'm like, where where do people go? You know. <laughs> And I heard these two guys in the musical theater wing of Tish saying, oh, there's a guy, there's a place on 81st Street where all the Columbia gay guys go. <laughs> so this is like what a great detective Columbia I or am. Columbia? <laughs> I wish. Yeah, it was exactly. very, it's very white and collegiate up there. Uh, but I went up there. And I brought a little packet of lube. Right. I was like, this is going to be the night. You're, you're set. It's packet of lube. But I was so intimidated by being in the cruising I atmosphere. Yeah, I can imagine. All of, like all my, you know, through my childhood, I was so uh, nervous about competition between men in sports. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, no, now now we're all competing with each other for each <laughs> other. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I just got drunk and drunk and drunk on this PBR. And I, finally I was like, oh, my God, I have to go out. I, I, I hadn't, like, been able to say hello to anybody. So I leave the bar. And I look across the street and I notice this big black void. And I'm like, oh my God, that's this place they call Central Park. <laughs> and I've heard that, that guys have anonymous encounters there. So I go off into the park and then I'm like, wait a minute. I've heard that this is a pretty big bar. Yeah, so it's big. <laughs> <laughs> and can be, back then, it can still be very dangerous. <laughs> exactly. And there is a place in the park where guys right. gather, but it, it, I was nowhere near there. So I was like, well, maybe if I just like hide in the bushes and rustle them a bit, if a guy walks by, he's probably on the way to the forest sex party or something. <laughs> I try it out. Some guy passes and he's like, what is this guy doing in the bushes? And he runs out of there. So I'm like, oh, this is a disaster. I, l let me just, like, take the load off my feet for a minute. So I fall asleep for, like, an hour and a half. Wow. And when I wake up, I have no shoes. Uh. Someone has <laughs> stolen my shoes. Well, of course. <laughs> so I'm like, this evening, this, my first evening of hooking up in New York is a fiasco. They left the lube and took your shoes? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's odd. <laughs> So I go to the subway. I'm like, all right, the evening's definitely over. And when the train whirls in, that nausea from the beer before. Oh, you're shoeless on the subway. Yeah. It Paps full ribbon. It, it goes <laughs> bing, bing. The doors open, and I throw up into the car. Oh, oh, man. And there's like six people on the car, and they're like, what? Who throws up into <laughs> the car? Yeah, by then you have the option to leave, though. <laughs> you could have just left. But then I jump in. I jump in. Oh, I see? can't miss this train. <laughs> but I'm in my socks, and, and there's oh. you know, a mess. So I go, swoop, bam, oh, down no. into my own mess. Oh. That's fantastic. Great oh, first night. That is a great of, uh, story. Trying to hook up in the city. <laughs> that's what conservatives, conservative Republicans, see, and that's why you shouldn't be gay. <laughs> you lose your shoes and end up wallowing in vomit. So now, when did you officially have a first successful encounter? Oh gosh, you know the limelight. Do you remember the uh, the church? I, yeah. I went there a few times. Yeah, the limelight used to have this if church you went, on Sixth Avenue and Twentieth Street. Right, it was a church that they turned into a. Disco One of the place. most successful nightclub in the history of New York, besides Studio Fifty Four, probably. Yeah, 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 it was hmm. it was pretty awesome. And I they, went there a few times, just and it was you know there was places you could just openly do drugs and a lot. Yeah, 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 it was a fun time. There was a room that was all foam, like yeah, you walk yeah. In and it's it was bubbles. like the first place to do that. Yeah, and it really was a church at one point. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah. yeah, it was pretty beautiful. <laughs> right. Um, but on the gay night, if you went all the way up the steeple at the very top, there was this dark room where dudes just hooked up with sure. each other. And I was like, I had no idea that that really happened. <laughs> so I was like, wow, this is perfect. So that's when I started getting into that sort of thing. But a, a couple, a little bit after first going to one of those places, I ended up with someone. I took him home. He, This Japanese guy who, when we got into my apartment, he, uh, he forced me to tie my shoes to my junk. <laughs> really? Really? What? With your shoes on? No, no, no. Because they try, wanted... try to let somebody steal your shoes now. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. All, all my early sexual experiences involved <laughs> my shoes. No, no. We came into my apartment and I, I because I had met, I had met him at a place a lot like the limelight. I brought him home. And uh, he went into this dominance and submission, wow. which, which at that point I was, unlike Mike, I was totally <laughs> unaware of it at that point. <laughs> 
But oh, no, God. he starts uh, ordering me. He's like, tie the shoes to your balls. I'm like, what? <laughs> he had to show me what he meant. He wanted me to tie, well, of tie course. the laces together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what do you mean? And then like a propeller put it around my balls. Oh, my God. So they'd be hanging at my shins. Wow. You know? So I was like, well, I'm so curious as to where this could be going next. <laughs> You're very open-minded. <laughs> yeah, I gave it a shot. But there was no, that that was all of his plans for that. And then he left. That's the only thing he, he wanted. He probably went home and pleasured himself to that huh. image like 50 times. Yeah, after a while I was like, he was just standing there, you know, appreciating <laughs> it. And I'm like, what? What am I, nothing's going on for me well, you're calling, you're calling your friends in Cincinnati going, listen, I've had a couple of really weird nights here <laughs> in New York. It is everything. <laughs> So now, uh, right, let's take a break. When we come back, I want to hear the story about the woman yesterday. <laughs> Can we talk about that? Yeah, we'll be yeah. back with Kevin Allison on the Art of Language.